This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. Ah, my first computer. The Amstrad CPC 464 on Christmas 1985. But as we all know, there's always something better, something more powerful and something that promises more. As a 464 owner, the source of that envy was the Amstrad 6128. And today I'm going to show you that over 30 years later, it's never too late to treat yourself to the upgrade you always wanted. This is my CPC 6128. I purchased it from a classified ads app for the sum total of £20, or about $28. Not a bad price if it works, because despite Amstrad having a reputation for cheaply made consumer electronics, this machine has a reputation for being quite bulletproof. So the odds are in our favour today. Let's take a tour. Discs were the first thing that made me envy this. While I patiently loaded games from cassette tape, this machine sported a 3-inch disc drive. Compact floppy disk or CF2 disks hold 180 kilobytes per side and can be turned over to double that capacity. It's compact compared to the 5.25 inch disk, but it offers nothing the higher capacity 3.5 inch disk here can't deliver. Except perhaps a better profit margin for Amstrad, who had a deal with manufacturers to supply drives at a fixed percentage beneath the lowest priced 3.5 inch drive. It's rumoured the contract was so tight that Hitachi were making them at a loss towards the end of the format's life, in the Amstrad PCW range of computers, because it would be more expensive to break the agreement with Amstrad. It's a distinctly monochrome aesthetic compared to the 464's colourful keys, and this example shows all the signs of 30 years of neglect. Dirt, pen marks, dust, scuffs and scrapes, some of which we can tackle while others will remain the scars of its use. A couple of charts spoil an otherwise useful coffee cup shelf on the disk drive here, and they give the colour chart and key numbers for the CPC. The palette of 27 colours was high for 8-bit micros. Red, green and blue have 3 levels, giving 3 to the power of 3 combinations or 27 colours. 16 can be displayed simultaneously in low resolution mode, 4 in medium and 2 in high. The key numbers reference indicates the number assigned to each key. Further numbers are assigned to joystick inputs, although for more in-depth coding, you will likely use standard ASCII character codes for more flexibility. The back of the machine gives us a hint as to what's in store for us inside. Filthy edge connectors and more dust and dirt is clearly visible. From left to right we have an internal speaker, volume dial and power switch. We'll see a headphone jack on the side of the machine for a better audio experience and meet the AY sound chip inside. A secondary disk drive port is useful for both original and modern applications, as I hope to show you later in the series. Now, the monitor for the Amstrad and the 5 and 12 volt DC power inputs should be discussed collectively. In a time when households owned a single TV set, Amstrads quite usefully came with their own monitor, either in green or for an extra £100, in colour. Here's my original colour monitor. The monitor plugged into the mains and cables from the monitor relayed 5 volts for the computer to operate and 12 volts for the disk drive. My 464 only required 5 volts with its tape drive. The M2 accessory was also an option supplying the required power and enabling you to use RF input on a standard TV set. I don't have an Amstrad monitor so finding a modern solution for video output and power input is very high on my list. The expansion port here accommodates a small range of add-ons, such as additional memory, and the printer port, well, that's a printer port, and of course Amstrad also produced printers to further cash in on their Amstrad ecosystem. Around the corner of this lengthy machine are the stereo headphone jack, a joystick port, and rather usefully a tape port. The 6128 is backwards compatible with previous models, including my 464, so I could plug in a cassette deck and load up my old games from tape, maybe even copy them over to disk. So, let's open her up and see what's inside, but just before we do, I should mention the length of it. This little beast is a full 51 centimeters in length, which compared to other 80s micros is a big old unit. 
It's still smaller though than the 464 which comes in at 57 centimeters. If there are girthier 8-bit micros, I've yet to meet them. The CPC was the best-selling micro in France for a number of years, so these crocodiles are candidates for the Amstrad mascot. Roland is another who we'll meet in part two, and yes, that is a Minitel 36 number on the screen, which we learned all about in my Minitel episode. So there are no security screws here, just regular Phillips screws on the side and bottom of the unit. The Amstrad name is derived from Alan Michael Sugar trading. Lord Sugar, as he's known now, was a rags to riches story, trading on market stalls and working his way up. These units were made in Korea, as you can see. Lord Sugar was certainly a shrewder businessman than rival Clive Sinclair, who produced the ZX Spectrum. Poor decisions on Sir Clive's part forced the sale of his computer business to Amstrad in 1986, and so Spectrums continued to be produced by Amstrad into the early 90s. Keyboard cables are easily broken when opening up many 8-bit micros. These popped out though without any trouble thankfully, and there's a cable to the speaker and power light which is also easily removed, and then the top of the case is free from the base. And here are the guts of the 6128. We've no battery on board to leak, but we do have plenty of dust, and we can immediately see some familiar logos and names on the chips, such as Zilog, Motorola, Samsung, and Amstrad's own branded ICs. If I was a woodlouse, I'd probably live in an Amstrad too. These guys will be sympathetically reinterred in my Hoover. Ordinarily, at this point, I'd give you a tour of the system board, but I would rather do that with a clean board so we can actually read the chips. So let's strip the machine down, we'll give it a brush down and see what flavoured chips we have. It's certainly an easy machine to work on, again, nothing but Phillips screws to remove, and I've left the floppy cable in the main board as it's one of those connectors that clips around the cable and pierces into it to make contact. I find these are often very brittle to pop open and the plastic sometimes snaps off, so you either need glue or you need to replace it, I'd rather just leave it in place and not unsettle it. With the power switch and volume dial removed, our board is free. The keyboard will be further stripped for cleaning, as will the disk drive, but let's clean up the system board today. I'm using anti-static brushes to clean off loose debris and then more anti-static brushes and isopropyl alcohol to clean the board down. This is the first pass, I'll likely give it another once over in part 2. One of the chips you'll notice is under a heatsink, which I'll remove for the tour, and I have seen 6128s without this heatsink, but I'm always happy for additional cooling if it's effective. And now we can see the board, so what's on it? The CPU is a Zilog Z80A in a 40-pin dual inline package or DIP. We've met it before, it's a stalwart of 80s micros and other devices. This Z80 is socketed for easy replacement and is clocked at 4 MHz, the same as my old 464. That's an increase on the ZX Spectrum's 3.5 MHz, but CPU comparisons alone are fairly meaningless as the presence of supporting chips to take the load off of the CPU in these machines can make all the difference. Two ROM chips here enable the computer to boot up, provide a basic programming language and enable the 6128 to interface with a disk drive. Amstrad Disk Operating System or AMSDOS served to map the cassette access routines to a disk drive. 
This enabled cassette-based programs to run from disk without modification and supported up to two disk drives, which we'll put to the test later. The CPU may be the same as my 464, but RAM is certainly greater. Double in fact at 128K. The CPU can directly address 64 kilobytes because it has 16-bit memory addressing. So a technique called bank switching is used to access more RAM without the expense of a CPU with wider memory addressing. Bank switching doesn't allow the CPU to access more RAM at the same time, only different RAM. So the key is to not switch out memory in use by the program at the time. Using 16K in the second bank of RAM to draw the screen, and then swapping it into the RAM used for the video chip for example, is known as page flipping or double buffering, and can give you smoother, flicker-free graphics. Games would likely use machine code, but the bank manager and screen copy basic commands have been included in ROM for such functions in basic. When it comes to video, I'll highlight two chips which have a close relationship. On the right is the gate array, and on the left is the cathode ray tube controller, or CRTC. The CRTC generates screen displays, the horizontal and vertical sync signals, and tracks the address in memory from which the next pixel should be read. It doesn't draw the pixel, it just passes the information to the gate array. This 4T007 gate array is manufactured by Ferranti, although other manufacturers' chips do appear in the 6128. But this is a Ferranti branded chip, just like we found in the ULA and the Spectrum and the Acorn Electron. It has multiple duties and these are managing interrupts, memory management and the display. For the display it accepts the sync and memory location signal from the CRTC and converts bytes into pixels to be displayed according to the screen mode and palette in use. The result is that you have a lot of information about the display cycle and you can use this to create effects. Effects such as rupture splitting to split a screen vertically or horizontally or multiple modes displaying two different screen resolutions at the same time. They make a nice dynamic duo and gave the Amstrad the edge over the spectrum when used properly, but the CPC doesn't punch as highly as the Commodore 64, which had such capabilities as hardware sprites. The AY sound chip is a three-voice PSG or programmable sound generator, which dates back to 1978, when it was designed by General Instruments. You'll find it in the Intellivision, Vectrex, Auric One, MSXs, and later Spectrums, as well as many more machines. It was also licensed by Yamaha with minor modifications as the YM2149F, which we find in the original Atari ST. A fine enough chip in the 8 bits, but a little disappointing for a 16-bit machine Atari. This little chip had a distinctive voice, and it sounds like this. The Toshiba PPI, or Programmable Peripheral Interface here, manages the keyboard, a cassette if you plug one in, but also the AY sound chip. If you're programming for the sound chip, then you do have to access it through the PPI. Finally, we'll mention some important chips which were lacking in my 464. In addition to the ROM with disk operations baked into it, we also have the data separator and floppy disk controller. When the disk is accessed, there is first a clock pulse, which indicates a data bit is coming, followed by a data pulse with that data. The clock pulses keep the disk controller locked on to the stream of data when the speed of the motor and the disk drive fluctuates, which it does, its speed is not guaranteed. The data separator isolates the clock and the data pulses required to perform this task. The floppy disk controller can then get on with the job of accessing the disk with the separator's support. Aside from the three inch disk size, the controller is perfectly capable of supporting a standard PC floppy drive and with a little cable hacking, you can do just that. If I wanted a disk drive on my 464, I'd have needed something like this, the DDI-1 which incorporates the chips we've just looked at into its sizeable housing. And so the other British 8-bit micros gather around to see if the patient will come to life, or if work is needed to save it. 
Despite looking battered and bruised on the outside, actually it wasn't too bad on the inside once we got under all the dust. So I've gone ahead and ordered all the parts that I need, a power supply, um, some parts to service the disk drive because that will undoubtedly need servicing. And then in part two, we can find out just what kind of condition it's in. Will it fire up? Is further work needed to get it going? Or will it live up to its reputation of being bomb proof? I've also got some special guests to join us. So I look forward to showing you that and more in part two soon. Thank you for watching and take care. Retro Man Cave is made possible thanks to the generous patrons scrolling up your screen now. Check the link in the description if you'd like to join them, or if you'd like to visit the Retro Man Cave shop for retro mugs, posters and merchandise to support the channel. Thank you all for your support and for making Retro Man Cave possible.